6th of June, 1944, the greatest machine of World War II springs into action. It is made up of thousands of ships and aircraft, tens of thousands of men, and millions of tons of steel and concrete. I never knew there were that many boats, landing craft, ships, barges, or whatever, anywhere in the world. This is Overlord, the invasion machine that will send Allied soldiers dropping from the skies and storming the beaches of Normandy. Each piece of this machine has been designed to fulfill a specific task in the air, on land, or at sea. The success of D-Day depends upon it. Interlocking with pinpoint precision, the men and machines of Overlord overcome not just Hitler's beach defenses, but nature itself in the greatest assault the world has ever seen. We didn't know whether we were going to land right in front of a German pillbox or a gun emplacement or what. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations reveals the phenomenal hardware that made the day of days. Twelve sixteen a.m., sixth of June, nineteen forty-four, D-Day. Four years of trial and error had trained the men and built the war machine that would throw itself against Hitler's Atlantic Wall. Ever since the Blitzkrieg of nineteen forty, Europe had been under the iron heels of Nazi jackboots. Now the machine was in motion, which would drive them out. Each element of this machine had been through intensive research and development to ensure it did its job to perfection. The first component of the invasion machine to go into action was the Allied Airborne Force. Highly trained paratroopers prepared to leap from their aircraft into the night sky over Normandy. So we knew exactly what we were doing and to stand up, hook up and then check equipment and I uh, would check the equipment of the man in front of me and check my own equipment. Okay. Jumpmaster, stand in the door. And the idea was to get out of that plane. We were like, what's it called, an airborne shuffle. You, were, you, were, you had your knee and the next guy's behind, and you were shuffling out so that when you landed, you were close together. Carrying the first wave of paratroopers on D-Day was the C-47 transport aircraft. Well, outside of the Model T Ford, I think the C-47 was one of the great inventions of the millennium. The man behind this incredible aircraft was Donald Douglas. Asked by TWA to develop a passenger airliner to rival their competitors' Boeing models, his design was superb. Streamlined and wide-bodied, the fully developed aircraft took to the skies over America in 1935 as the DC-3 passenger airliner. The aircraft revolutionized air transport. Fast and powerful, with an outstanding safety record, the DC-3 soon came to the attention of the US Army Air Forces and entered service only 16 days after Pearl Harbor as the C-47. It was the ideal military transport aircraft and served all over the world. Now it was crucial to the airborne troops in the early hours of D-Day. It was the responsibility of the crew of the C-47 to make certain that the paratroopers were dropped as close to target as possible. And even a delay of three or four seconds in turning on the green light would have thrown them off their designated target zone. On D-Day, over a thousand C-47s carried 23,000 airborne troops into action. The ideally placed door in the C-47 meant that a full load of 20 paratroopers could leave the aircraft in just 10 seconds. The cargo carrying ability of the aircraft was also improved when this door was enlarged. This meant that heavy equipment and even wounded men on stretchers could easily be loaded aboard. We would haul litter patients, gasoline, ammunition, 
food, medical supplies, anything that had to be hauled to get to where it was destined to go in a hurry, the C-47 did it. It was so dependable for so many jobs. It was just a flying truck. Everything depended on whether or not the paratroopers could protect the flanks of the landing beaches and capture the routes needed for the advance inland. But the paratroopers could only carry light equipment and were vulnerable to armored attack. A way had to be found to get artillery and anti-tank guns right onto the drop zones. The answer to the problem was the glider. Two types of glider were used by the Allied Airborne Divisions on D-Day. The British Horsa was 67 feet long, was built almost entirely of wood and carried 25 troops or a six-pounder anti-tank gun. The smaller American CG-4 Waco had a fabric and plywood fuselage over a metal framework and could carry a jeep or 15 men. The cheap, lightweight construction of both designs meant that they could easily be towed by the C-47. If necessary, two Wacos could even be towed at the same time. The pinpoint accuracy of these simple, throwaway aircraft also made them ideal for special missions on June the 6th. As US paratroopers hit the ground in the American sector, 50 miles away, two gliders carrying men of the British 6th Airborne Division, led by Major John Howard, were about to show what gliders could do. In what has been described as one of the greatest flying achievements of the war, they located the vital Orne Canal Bridge in pitch darkness and swooped in to crash land at 100 miles an hour. Then there was a great scramble to get out because, you know, the last thing you want to be when you just landed close to a, a guarded bridge is to be sitting in a wooden, wooden glider. Almost as soon as we cleared the glider, Major Howard, typical of him, he was up on the bank of the canal saying, come on boys, this is it, come on, and we all charged after him. The German defenders were taken totally by surprise. By the time we got to that end of the bridge, they decided it was uh, not a good place to be staying around. We scattered to either side of the bridge up and down the canal bank and uh, took up all our defensive positions. As this actual photo taken on D-Day shows, the capture of the Orne Canal Bridge blocked the route to the D-Day invasion beaches for German armor. The men of the glider force were the vanguard of 150,000 troops who would land in Normandy over the next few hours. But after this promising start, things began to go badly wrong for the airborne invasion. Cloud banks over the drop zones caused the C-47 transports to veer off course and heavy anti-aircraft fire broke up their formations. The paratroopers of the American airborne divisions were scattered all over the Cotentin Peninsula, while vital heavy equipment was lost in swamps and rivers. Over the next few hours, small groups of men began to band together. Dick Winters was a young officer of the 101st Airborne and one of the first men on the ground on D-Day. He linked up with another paratrooper to work out exactly where they were. We exchanged greetings and uh... And coming down the road, he had been smart enough to stop at a stone marker. The stone marker said St. Muir Aglis. I was able to orient the map very quickly because the planes were coming in and they were flying from west to east. He had told me St. Muir Aglis is that town up there. There was St. Muir Aglis in my map. I knew exactly where it was. Winters and his men then began to secure the vital road exits from Utah Beach. By 3.45 a.m., a huge fleet of C-47s had taken the airborne divisions to Normandy. 1,300 aircraft and 800 gliders had carried 23,000 men, 110 jeeps, and 500 artillery pieces to drop zones deep behind enemy lines. The C-47s then became the paratroopers' lifeline bringing in vital supplies and reinforcements until they could link up with the troops landing on the beaches. But the day had only just started. More men and more machines were about to roll into action. All of your heroic airborne guys dropping on the Cotentin Peninsula and heroically walking through the night, they are only part of a very big complicated system. 
Unless every single man and machine did their job to perfection, D-Day could still have ended in chaos. The scene appeared in front of stunned German soldiers manning bunkers along the Normandy coast. 60 miles of ocean was packed with nearly 6,000 ships and craft of every shape and size. When the landing fleet arrived, it was unbelievably huge. We said, it can't be real. So many ships. And the horizon was black with ships. We said, we can do nothing now. We were actually threading through in daylight. These hundreds and hundreds of, of vessels, all in straight lines, a number that you couldn't have imagined. You'd look ahead and see these lines stretching right to the horizon. Seconds after appearing out of the mist, the invasion fleet announced its arrival with a terrifying bombardment. By clockwork, the battleships, cruisers and destroyers each added their contribution to the weight of metal smashing down on German beach fortifications. A storm of 15-inch, 8-inch and 5-inch shells. Joining these conventional fighting ships were new craft designed specially for this day, rocket ships. Their decks were crammed with racks holding hundreds of rockets tipped with five-inch warheads. A barrage from a single rocket ship could pulverize hundreds of yards of beach, shredding barbed wire entanglements and obliterating minefields. Under the cover of the bombardment, assault troops prepared to cross the last miles of sea to the shore. We climbed over into the landing craft and we were, you know, 10, 11 miles out and uh, the, the sea was rough. And that's when everybody got wet and cold and you're getting seasick. The machines that carried men like Bob Slaughter to their destiny on the beaches of France had been years in the making, but without them, an amphibious landing, one of the most complex and dangerous operations in war, would have been impossible. Not only do you have to deal with the land, not only do you have to deal with the sea, but in amphibious operations, you have to deal with the interface. You've got to cross the line between the two. The first major amphibious landing in modern times dates back to World War I. In 1915, Britain used its naval power to bypass the deadlock of trench warfare on the Western Front in France with an assault on Turkey's Gallipoli Peninsula. Thousands of men stormed the beaches to destroy the gun positions blocking the route to the Black Sea and Russia. The assault was a disaster. No one had thought through how you do these uh, kind of operations, how you coordinate the naval gunfire, how you coordinate the naval landings. They didn't have the equipment, so you're essentially jerry-rigging equipment. Uh, for the landings, and none of the troops had been trained for it. The British Army, the Australians, the New Zealanders are all lined up on the beach, coming ashore in small boats, and being shredded by Turkish machine guns and artillery. So the story of Gallipoli is kill, 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 and it's the Turks doing all the killing. Gallipoli made a strong impression on military planners in America and Britain. Both countries saw the potential of amphibious warfare if only the technology could catch up. Up to the early 1930s, infantry still had to land on beaches by jumping out of boats and wading ashore. By World War II, Allied designers realized that a brand new machine was needed, a machine that could carry troops across that deadly divide between land and sea. They need boats that are designed to come into shallow water, come right up to the beach, and get the cargo off quickly. And the Americans, among other places, turn to people whose job it is to design and build river craft. In 1938, the US Marines first tested a new shallow draft boat capable of landing troops and small vehicles. Made by a New Orleans-based maverick boat builder called Andrew Jackson Higgins, it was an early version of the landing craft that will be the backbone of the D-Day invasion. Britain, too, had been developing specialized landing craft to carry troops and vehicles. 
But these early craft were slow and awkward, and before they could be fully developed, Europe was once again engulfed by war. In 1940, Britain's tiny force of landing craft was destroyed, not in landing, but in evacuating troops from Dunkirk. Yet only a few weeks later, Winston Churchill ordered amphibious raids on occupied France to begin. A new organization was set up to coordinate these raids and to develop the machines they needed. Newly trained forces of commanders would carry out these missions in what would become known as combined operations. I volunteered for combined operations because I thought I'd have more responsibility and certainly it meant serving a small craft, which is what I wanted. But at that time they needed plenty of officers, obviously, for what was coming in the next few years. These early commando raids were mere pinpricks against the Nazi war machine, but were key to working out every possible problem before D-Day. Meanwhile, the US pushed ahead with its own landing craft designs and amphibious invasion techniques. The basic landing craft that carried the assault divisions on D-Day was about 40 feet long, weighed 13 tons, and carried 30 infantrymen. The secret of the successful assault landing craft was the flat bottom, which stopped it getting stuck on shore, and a ramp bow, which allowed troops to disembark quickly before they became an easy target for enemy guns. In the United States, they were known as Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, LCVP. Britain used a similar design tested in early commando raids called the Landing Craft Assault, or LCA. The LCA was quite a good uh, sea boat. It was low in the water and it was specifically designed to come in at night uh, as a surprise attack. But they were uh, wider than the LCVP, they were a little bit lower and they had more armor on them. It was a uh, probably a better landing craft than the LCVP. It was, a, you know, the LCVPs were made of plywood and these were steel. When they left their motherships on D-Day, the landing craft headed to the beaches in long columns. Over the last few hundred yards, they would spread out to form a line or wave so that all their troops would hit the beach at exactly the same moment. To break up the wave formation, the Germans constructed thousands of obstacles along the beaches of France. These could rip the bottoms out of landing craft or blow them and their human cargo to pieces. At dawn on D-Day, the coxswains of 2,400 LCAs and LCVPs knew that they were heading straight for a killing zone. Every man had to use all his skill to avoid the obstacles and get his troops safely ashore right on target, or the first critical moments of the invasion would be a disaster. Commanding 18 LCAs of the first wave on Omaha Beach was Lieutenant Jimmy Green. We had the easiest wave, I think, because we were clear of the obstacles. The second and third waves landed actually in amongst the obstacles. Some of our craft uh, were hit and disabled. Um, of our 18 LCAs, we lost six. We didn't know whether we were going to land right in front of a German pillbox or a gun emplacement or what. And I remember telling the rest of them, I said, we're going to catch hell. As they went up the beach, the Germans opened up with their machine guns and wiped them out. I think there were something like two wounded survivors when the second wave went in. The terrible casualties did not slow down the pace of the invasion. Each successive wave reaching the beach added to the overwhelming build-up of troops who held themselves against the German defences. But this was only the very tip of the Allied spearhead, and it could still be blunted by heavy attack on land and above all from the air. If the invasion was to be a success, the D-Day machine had to win control of the skies over Normandy. Midning, 6th of June. Allied aircraft patrolled the skies high above the beaches where thousands of troops were pouring ashore from landing craft. This was the most vulnerable moment of the entire invasion. If the German air force had attacked, they could have caused havoc on the beaches. My feeling was that, I mean, if you see it, you go after it. Just be aggressive. I think we're about as aggressive a unit that was in the American Air Force. 
because an amphibious operation is so vulnerable to air attack, it is a necessary precondition to any amphibious operation that you have control of the skies overhead. A low fighter aircraft dominated the skies on the 6th of June. The story of the destruction of the Luftwaffe began months earlier with the heavy bombers of the US 8th Air Force. Their mission? To destroy the Luftwaffe on the ground. Every target that we had was German aircraft factories, either the engine factories or the plane themselves. It had something to do with, with, the, with the German Air Force. Though the bombers caused severe damage, German fighters made them pay a heavy price. Listen, I'm telling you, those fighters sometimes, it just looked like a swarm of bees. Uh, and you, you thought they, they couldn't have any on the ground. They got them all up here in the sky, you know. And it was different groups come up at different times. They would be uh, ME 109s at one time, and then, you know, half hour later, there'd be FW 190s from some other fighter group. And the, you'd hit, hit different ones, they would catch you at different spots. Until you got to the target, you were very fortunate if you got through it and didn't get something hit. To take on the enemy aircraft that attacked bombers on their way to the target, a high-performance, long-range escort fighter was desperately needed. Rolls-Royce engineers tried fitting a low-level American fighter called the P-51 with their famous Merlin engine. The result was the best Allied fighter of the war, and it would prove crucial to the D-Day invasion. The new and improved P-51 Mustang not only had extraordinary performance at high altitude, but fitted with extra fuel tanks, had the range to escort heavy bombers to distant targets. Arriving in Britain at the end of 1943, the new Mustang squadrons were just in time to support the bombers, led by 8th Air Force Commander General Doolittle in the run-up to D-Day. General Doolittle said, now is the time for us to go after the fighters. The bombers had done their job, they destroyed the main targets, and they say from now on we're going to go get them. Of course, then it was dog eat dog. Everybody was going after every damn thing that moved. We always attacked. Uh, we always attacked, no matter how many. And it shortened the war. In the months leading up to D-Day, more than 2,000 German fighters were destroyed in grueling air battles, crippling the Luftwaffe's ability to control the air over Europe on the 6th of June. With the Luftwaffe decimated, the next preemptive strike for the invasion could begin. A bombing campaign against the French railway and road system was launched, so that German reinforcements wouldn't be able to reach the Normandy beaches. They had us knocking out bridges and communications and trains south of the invasion. Now, the idea there was to prevent the Germans from bringing the troops down south up around to fight our boys when our boys went in. And we stopped them pretty good. To back up the bombers, fighters like the Mustang were assigned the task of attacking the trains themselves. In a single day, 46 locomotives were destroyed and another 32 damaged. On D-Day itself, as the invasion fleet neared the shore, a squadron of marauder bombers came in at low level just ahead of the first wave. The day that we hit, we went up and dropped 500 pound bombs in front of the cliffs, not on the Germans. We dug foxholes with bombs to where when our troops came in, they could dive down in the hole and protect themselves. Beyond the beaches, 33 squadrons of fighters ranged inland, attacking German airfields and paralyzing attempts to strike at the invasion fleet. We were authorized to go down on the deck. And then you have a lot of fun there. Anything that moves, you shoot it. So we use up our ammunition, uh, most of it, before we come back home. Without the work of the Mustang, 
The thousands of men who had fought their way onto the beaches from landing craft would have been sitting ducks for the Luftwaffe. By mid-morning, the aerial component of the invasion machine dominated the skies overhead. Over the Channel and over England, and certainly over the invasion, the skies were swept clean by all the fighters. But it was icing on the cake to have the P-51s also able to shoot against German uh, bombers and shoot against German fighters during the D-Day time. On this extraordinary day, with the waters off the Normandy coast full of targets, the best Goering's once mighty Luftwaffe could do was a single brief sortie by just two fighters. In contrast, 3,000 Allied aircraft flew over 14,000 missions in support of the troops below them. Yet on the beaches, those troops were still under German artillery fire. More tanks, artillery and vital supplies were now needed to establish a bridgehead. The next wave of machines, amphibious craft and tank landing ships, began to move to the front of the battle line. Without them, the D-Day machine would grind to a halt. Midday, 6th of June, 1944. Allied assault troops had successfully landed on the beaches of Normandy. They now needed vital supplies to help them push further inland. Coming in just behind the assault waves was one of the strangest craft to appear on the Normandy beaches, the DUKW, popularly known as the Duck. For driver Stanley Dobson, D-Day was not what he had expected. Nobody told you that what it was going to be like when you got there. I remember looking over the, the, the sand dunes at the time they were unloading the Duck and they saw the infantry actually fighting to take a cottage. I heard this, uh, what I thought was the sound of bees, and suddenly realised it was uh, machine gun bullets coming. It wasn't over the top. I suddenly realised, oh, what am I doing here? The amphibious duck was a revolutionary design and answered another vital Allied need for a vehicle that could travel on land as easily as it navigated at sea. In 1942, the US Army had realized that even with a successful landing craft to get troops ashore, there would be a delay getting supplies forward to the front line. What they needed was another machine that could carry those supplies from transport ships inland to supply dumps. Leading yacht designer Rod Stevens was chosen to design this new vehicle. In just 38 days, he and his team transformed a standard army truck into an amphibian by adding a boat-shaped hull and a propeller. It was built for whatever you're going to use it for, whether it be land or sea. You didn't have to worry about where you're going. You know you get there. So It's just simple engineering when you get down to it. It may seem complicated to some people, but in theory, most of it is simple. The duck could offload equipment from the heavy transports at sea and carry it inland, right to its target. On D-Day, the astonishing versatility of the duck was vital to the success of the Allied landings. I'd been dropped somewhere in the region of three, four miles from the shore. Our ducks were all loaded up with stores, a little of each. The idea, of course, had been one of the first ducks onto the beach was that we had something for everybody. We had petrol and rations and ammunition, tank shells, things like this. We had a little bit of everything. It was amazing, I think, the organization that went into that. While the duck carried urgently needed supplies to the troops already in action, waiting offshore were larger transport craft, carrying the thousands of tanks, guns and trucks that had been stockpiled in Britain for the invasion. They would make all the difference to the fight on the beaches, but they needed a completely different kind of craft to get them ashore. As early as July 1940, Churchill had sent a note to the Minister of Supply. What is being done about designing and planning vessels to transport tanks across the sea for a British attack on enemy countries? The response in November of the same year was the landing craft tank, the LCT. Early models could carry five tanks, but later versions held double that number. With a crew of 12 and a speed of 11 knots, they provided the heavy lift necessary to carry tanks right up onto the beach. But to carry both troops and tanks in larger numbers, the only solution was the much bigger landing ship tank, or LST. The vast majority of LSTs were built in the dockyards of America. 
These 4,000 ton ships had two decks with room for 20 Sherman tanks and 200 troops. Just as important, they could act as mother ships for the assault landing craft, carrying them on the upper deck and lowering them into the water like lifeboats. And like the smaller landing craft, the LSTs were flat bottomed with a ramp and bow doors. They could go right onto the beach to unload their cargo. The landing ship tank is so mind-bogglingly useful that everybody wants one. In fact, they want a few hundred of them. The LST is the most popular girl at the dance, and her dance card is full. Builders worked around the clock to roll out over a thousand LSTs. Though demand for them came from the Pacific as well as Europe, planners knew that they were essential for D-Day. Even the date that the invasion could be launched depended on these priceless vessels. The availability of amphibious landing ships dictated the tempo of the war in the, in the European theater. The Americans wanted to go cross-channel in 1942. They were persuaded out of that simply because we didn't have the landing craft to go cross-channel. Off the Normandy beaches, the LSTs lowered their bow ramps to allow ducks to drive straight onto the cargo decks for more supplies. In a few hours, the LSTs would be able to go right onto the beaches to unload themselves. But this was a slow process, and the beached LSTs were easy targets for gunfire. The only way to speed up the unloading process was to have a fully functional port. Knowing that a port was so essential to an invasion of France, British Combined Operations planners executed a large-scale commando raid to test defences around the French port of Dieppe two years earlier. Now, we ran into a convoy about half an hour or so before we were supposed to land. The port was then alert, was well defended, and all hell was in place. The tanks put ashore and weren't able to get off the beach because they didn't have any um, grip, and it was a complete disaster. It's something which um, I'd rather forget, but it did teach us a lesson not to attack a, a port. The tragedy of Dieppe was a major setback. Out of a raiding force of 6,000 men, more than 3,000 were killed, wounded or captured. The Germans were now alert and expecting the Allies to attack a port as part of any invasion. Allied engineers had to find a solution to the port problem or the invasion would be impossible. You can't get large quantities of supplies ashore from transport ships onto a beach. So if you are not sure of getting or holding an existing port in working condition, you've got to bring your own. Taking a port to France was such a radical solution to the problem that many believed it was pure fantasy. Mervyn Walter was a young brigadier chosen to turn fantasy into reality. His ultra-secret project would go down in history as Mulberry. To design the pieces for two great harbours, to construct the pieces for the two harbours all over the United Kingdom, to assemble the pieces on the English south coast, to tow the pieces one by one through a hundred miles of German-infested sea, to the French coast, that was the operation which was codenamed Mulberry. Each Mulberry Harbour had to enclose an area as large as New York Central Park and handle as much shipping as a major port. Within the harbour wall would be the pier heads, which were essential features of the Mulberry. This is where the LSTs would discharge the cargo that would be the deciding factor in the success of D-Day. Mounted on legs which extended to the seabed, the platform between the legs was raised or lowered with the tide. From the pier heads to the shore were steel roadways, each span connected to the next with flexible joints which allowed them to follow the movement of the waves. Altogether, some 10 miles of floating roadway would be needed. To create the sheltered water for a harbour, breakwaters would be built out of 147 enormous concrete boxes called Phoenix caissons. Able seaman Ken Bungard was amazed by his first sight of a caisson. The first thing I saw was a huge office block with no windows, no doors, standing by the quayside. In fact, it was 
60 foot high, 60 foot wide and 200 feet long and looked like a giant egg box. It did not occur to us at that time that this thing floated. And we were amazed that the tug that was tied up to us suddenly started pulling and we moved. Over 22,000 men worked around the clock on the caissons. Astonishingly, they were completed in only nine months. Mervyn Walter's work was at the heart of the D-Day invasion. The British Chiefs of Staff wrote this. The Mulberry project is so vital that it must be considered the crux of the whole operation, and it must not fail. By early afternoon on the Normandy beaches, the LSTs and ducks were working desperately to get supplies ashore. Now the prefabricated Mulberry harbors would take center stage. Without a steady flow of heavy equipment, the men who had fought and died on the beaches would have fought in vain. But would this huge revolutionary apparatus stand up to the pounding waves off the Normandy coast on D-Day? The Mulberry fleet, the anchor of the D-Day machine, churned towards the Normandy coast. Engineers were already ashore marking out positions for the harbor's massive components. First to arrive were the 63 obsolete battleships and cruisers and worn out merchant ships making their final voyages to France. After being towed into position, they were sunk to form breakwaters off the landing beaches. At the same time, the crews of the Phoenix caissons were crossing the channel on their lumbering concrete vessels. There's one thing I've never forgotten to this day, and that was, of course, the sound of the waves banging against the side of these caissons. It was like a huge drum. It was a huge boom, boom, boom going on all the time. Once into position, the crew aboard each caisson opened the valves which allowed the sea to rush in. Thousands of tons of concrete settled on the seabed in carefully marked sites to form the outlines of the two harbours. Finally, looming over the horizon came the strange shapes of the pierheads, ready to put down their legs and form the mooring point for the floating roadways. At these pierheads, the transport ships would unload their troops and supplies directly into trucks. They would take them along the roadways and across the beaches to marshalling areas inland. The naval construction battalions at Omaha Beach, the Seabees, and the Royal Engineers at Aramarsh on Gold Beach worked day and night to get the harbours ready. The harbour itself was about the size of Dover Harbour, and considering how long it took to build it, it was quite a remarkable feat. In an incredibly short time, both Mulberry harbours were completed. The heavy supplies, tanks, trucks, bridging and airfield construction equipment all started to dock. Most of this heavy equipment was unloaded at the vital LST piers. The landing ships could come onto the end of the roadway, the doors opened and the tanks just ran ashore. And they ran ashore from two levels and we were able to discharge a complete landing ship tank in 40 minutes, whereas it took six hours on the beaches to that was the difference between a port and the beach. Within the sheltered waters of the two harbours, the hundreds of landing craft could beach. Simultaneously, hundreds of ducks scurried back and forth, keeping up a constant traffic of smaller loads to and from larger merchant vessels offshore. It seemed as though the Mulberry project was working perfectly. But then, disaster struck. On the 19th of June, one of the worst gales in living memory threw up huge waves against the prefabricated harbours and shipping massed offshore. When the gale came, we had something like 200 craft moored inside the harbour, taking refuge. Every so often, one of them drew its anchor and started to wander. They would be taken in charge by a tug and prevented from rolling onto the long floating roadways which were so vulnerable and he even had to sink two ships to prevent them going on the road. With supplies slowing to a trickle, the advance inland had to be suspended while the storm lasted. It seemed as though the overlord invasion machine had been stopped in its tracks. 
The seas finally subsided, but the damage to the Mulberry Harbor at Omaha Beach was immense. The concrete caissons had crumbled under the pounding of the waves, and even worse, ships disabled by the storm had been driven into the harbor like floating battering rams. Whole sections of floating roadway had been hurled onto the beach, along with the wreckage of landing craft and small ships. In the midst of the destruction, the ducks rose to the challenge. They worked their way round the wreckage, drove out to ships whether they were beached or afloat, and then went inland to offload precisely where supplies were needed. In no time at all, the remains of the Mulberry A at Omaha were salvaged to repair the almost intact Mulberry B at Aramanche. Supplies started to flow again, and the vital heavy equipment used the Mulberry while the beaches handled the increasing flow of troops. Savage fighting held back the enemy while the supply build-up went on. C-47 transport aircraft continued to provide the armies with supplies and act as flying ambulances to get the wounded back to hospitals in Britain. At the same time, squadrons of Allied fighter bombers dominated the battlefield. The Allied armies, tanks, infantry and massed artillery drove forward to liberate town after town. Two and a half million troops, half a million vehicles, and four million tons of supplies were delivered to France. It was an achievement unparalleled in history. Two words sum up the D-Day machine's performance. Mission accomplished. You know what the great hero of Normandy was? The one thing that made it all work? There isn't one. Normandy is an example of a system of systems. It is an example of many little moving parts brought into a single system through careful coordination. The level of coordination in both time and space was the largest effort ever undertaken by mankind. However small our part was, a very small cog in a very large machine, afterwards, we began to feel very proud of what we'd done. The landing craft they developed and the cooperation that existed between the three services came to fruition on D-Day. Well, I think as far as the Ducks are concerned, if they hadn't had the Duck, we wouldn't have had Normandy. It's simple as that. These pilots and crew of the C-47 would go about anywhere and do anything. They were just wonderful people and very courageous. We all knew our job and we performed as best we could. Every crew member on every aircraft in our outfit did a tremendous job. Uh, the missions with the P-51 were more or less cut and dried. It's probably a horrible thing to say, but I got a hell of a good kick out of it, particularly when you're winning. Ingenuity, imagination, and sheer hard work by dedicated teams had created one of the most complex and sophisticated war machines in history. The D-Day machine, a machine of men and metal, pushed the boundaries of engineering and defined freedom over 60 years ago.